Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Marathon Man by William Goldman. Dane reads. So uh, William Goldman wrote Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and he also wrote The Princess Bride, which is one of my favourite movies, although uh, I didn't enjoy the book as much as the uh, movie, and it's one of the rare few occasions where that's happened. And I have a feeling the same might be true of this. I've actually, I'm downloading the movie of this at the moment to give it a watch. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe the movie will be better, but I didn't particularly like the book. But we're gonna go through and uh, I'm gonna share the, the, first off we're gonna share the blurb, then I'll go through and check out my tabs before I share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Babe is a brilliantly gifted young historian. Working on the thesis which will clear his father, hounded to death by Senator McCarthy, he is also striving through non-stop practice to become the greatest marathon runner in the world. And there she was, seated, reading, alone, at his very own corner table, the blue-eyed wonder. Seemingly, Babe's earnest decency is to be rewarded at last with a share of the good times. He writes to his brother and best friend, After all these crummy years, my cup is running over. But Marathon Man is a different kind of book. In a few sickening days, Babe's innocent, ordered world turns into a haunted arena of pursuit and terror, where the only certainty is that nothing is certain, where the oases of light swiftly turn out to be mirages, where, caught in the ineradicable stench of the Third Reich, between agents who have only their utter ruthlessness in common, he soon finds that he needs all his speed and more. With the wit and sinister lightness of a Pied Piper, Marathon Man will lead you totally unbelieving through all its unbelievable twists until, fighting for breath with Babe, you reach its amazing climax. You may never read a more exciting book. Um, mate, it was really boring actually. It was a very slow burner. I was expecting from that description for it to be like a thriller. And I mean, I suppose there are elements of thrillerness in it, but mostly it's um, kind of a meandering, sort of philosophical thing almost at times. So let's check some tabs anyway. So I think this kind of, this here towards the start helps to sort of set the scene for this a little bit and to set like the mood of it and some of the themes it has. Rosenbaum began to come to grief himself at the corner of 87th and Lexington. The light was red, which was no big deal. Anyone could survive a red light. But the car in front of him, the car at the light, was a stupid goddamn Nazi Volkswagen and worse, it was waiting smack in the centre of 87th Street, so he couldn't edge by to the light and then leave it behind when things turned green. Rosenbaum honked a couple of times, muttering to himself, but what could you expect from any jerk in a VW? He himself was a Chevy man, and had been since before the war. If you really knew cars, if you wanted your pennies to count for something, you drove a Chevy. Anyone who didn't was a schlemiel, which is a great Yiddish word. I just like this. Humour was the unexpected juxtaposition of incongruities. Who had said that? Levy rooted around in his mind a moment before he decided on Hazlitt. No, Meredith maybe. GB Shaw? Think, he commanded, but the right name would not come. I, I think anybody who's ever had toothache can kind of relate to this as well. He says, uh, For he had a toothache, and as he ran, as his right foot hit the ground, it jarred the cavity on the right side of his upper jaw. For a moment, Levy rubbed the offending tooth, wondering if he should see a dentist now or not. The thing had come on only lately, and maybe it would depart as it had come, because it hadn't gotten worse, and proved a nuisance only when he ran. Dentists raped you anyway, they charged a ton for maybe two minutes work, and there were better things to spend your money on. Like books, all the books ever printed. Records, too. To hell with it, Levy decided. In the end, it didn't really matter. Once they found his weakness, they almost killed him, which is very true. We'll probably get to some scenes. I think I tabbed a few out later on. We get a lot of racial slurs, one for Chinese people, one for black people. I think later on we get one for Hispanic people as well. But it kind of gives the book a kind of gritty realism, I suppose. It's just unpleasant to read, you know? And we get this little bit here. I must not become vulnerable, Scylla decided. Easy enough to decide, but why had he gone wild in the men's room? Why had the sight of an ill-fitting wig in the corner of a toilet stall sent him into fury? Because, Scylla realised, because it was hard for him even to shape the thought. Because I want to die with someone who loves me. There, out, admitted, done. And was it so terrible a wish? Was it so much to ask of life, a decent dying? Probably. And we got this great bit as well. Uh, again, anyone who's a student will know this, and also teachers. Bisenthal sat behind the desk now. All rise, he said, and depart swiftly. With one final admonition, the group stopped. Many students are afraid that when they contact their teachers, they might be somehow bothering them. Let me assure you that in my case, that is totally and 100% true. You will be bothering me. So please do it as infrequently as possible. He almost smiled as he said it, and the others laughed, but uncertainly. And uh, he quotes James Bond, and this is one of my favorite uh, Ian Fleming quotes. So, uh, so uh, the professor says, that is not just the way things work out, Levy, because your father was also a Rhodes and your father attended that same co-ed pit in Ohio and he also came here for his doctorate. There's a line in a James Bond novel, Levy. The first time it's coincidence, the second time it's happenstance, the third time it's enemy action. Great line. And an uh, interesting little start to chapter five here, bearing in mind again he's a historian, you know. 
Levy sat alone in a corner of the library working on America in 1875. Not that specific date actually, specific dates were garbage. His father had written, for the pedant, dates are deities worthy of worship. But for the true social historian, they are minutiae only, a shorthand, convenient reminders and no more. You do not ask a Titanic survivor, let me see now, just exactly when was that? You ask him this, what was it like, how did you feel? And that is the job of the social historian, to make the past vibrant for the present, to emotionally involve those of us who were not there, and to make us understand. I mean, I don't know if that's the best example because the, the Titanic hit the iceberg late on the evening of the 13th of April 1912 and sank just in the early morning of the 14th. So, I, don't, I mean, I... Uh, and uh, I kind of relate to this because I think this... I mean, maybe this is just me being a terrible person. I don't know, but this is kind of my experience with women. The truth was, girls were a problem. Not that he didn't adore them on general principles. It was just this. No girl he had ever cared for had given him a tumble, and none of those who wanted him could he ever convince himself to crave equally in return. Every girl who came after him was all the time so smart. There wasn't a Phi Beta at college who didn't eye him at least once during his undergraduate days. And he dated a lot, was intimate with a few, but they bored him. Just because they were smart and he was smart, they always assumed he wanted intellectual conversation, and he hated it. Give him a waitress with a C cup and a sweet soul, and probably he would have settled and gladly. But it never worked out. It never had, and it never would. Oh my god, Levy thought she's walking in this direction. And here we have it right at the start of chapter 8. Babe got out his aging Remington and began to pound. And I just love this like reference to a typewriter because I, not too long ago, read uh, this bad boy down here, which is uh, Uncommon Type by Tom Hanks. And the idea here is that these are short stories and all of them are linked together because they feature a typewriter. So it was just weird to then read this and be like, oh, the typewriter's back again, you know? It's a great quote here from Babe. Again, another one I kind of relate to. All my life I've been drooling after other guys' girls. You don't know what it's like to watch the other bastards drooling after mine. That happened with one of my exes. Except it was kind of annoying because I'd hear people having these like conversations. Like old men being like, oh I danced with her at so and so event. It's like, you're treating her like an object mate. And uh, just like this, like this. Because again, this is kind of me, I'm a pacifist, you know. But sometimes you still get angry. I swear, if I'd had a knife, I would have stabbed him, and if I'd had a bomb, I would have blown him apart. And then I would have gone after the limper, and I would have tried to get him with my hands. Me, I'm a liberal, an historian. I never once wanted to hurt anybody. I never even wanted Richard Nixon to suffer, and right now I want to kill, and it scares me. A great bit here, I assume this is true. I don't know if any of you guys who are watching are like have been served in the military, but I understand this is kind of still the case. Okay, now, are you aware just how much each part of the government hates each other part? For example, the military. The army hates the navy and the navy hates the air force. Why? Because once upon a time, the army was it. And then the world changed and the navy became the glamour branch. And then flip, another change, and now the air force gets everything it requests while the admirals and the army generals eat it. Think of what's going on down there today. It's on TV all day long, plain and crappy. The FBI hates the CIA and they both hate the Secret Service. They're squabbling and whining, continual internecine rivalry. And the whining gets loudest when you get close to the limits of their powers. The edges are sharp and between those edges are crevices. We live in the crevices, Janeway said. Ba babe was like asked to do something a bit dangerous basically and we get this. Babe didn't even hesitate. Bogart wouldn't have hesitated. I wasn't upset, Mr. Janeway, I swear it. It was just curiosity. Now that I know, I think it's terrific. I mean, historians don't get much chance to have adventures. It's kind of a sedentary profession, you know what I mean? Sit on your tail all day, read, read, read. Besides, I hadn't planned on going out till the afternoon, so what you're asking me to do is what I was going to do anyway, only without police protection. I mean, Indiana Jones kind of buckles the trend there, but he's, he's fictional, as is these guys, to be fair. But, so here we get this bit with the teeth, which is pretty grim. So, uh, my God, Babe thought, he's cleaning my teeth. Madness. The guy moved his tools around quickly in Babe's mouth. Light taps here, gentle probes there, all very deft. I wonder if I should ask him how bad my cavity is, Babe thought. Then he wondered what the guy's fees were, because what the hell, as long as they were all together, the guy could at least put in a temporary filling for a few bucks. For the briefest moment, Babe wanted to laugh. Only, of course, he didn't because it wasn't funny. Because, of course, it was frightening. Dentists were frightening, no matter how much music they piped into their offices or the number of Novocaine shots they offered. It was all very primitive, it went beyond pain. The dentist meant fear, just like in Psycho, in the shower scene, that meant fear. There was something unconsciously terrifying about taking a shower with a curtain drawn, and it was the same with the dentist. You never knew what might happen next. And what happens next is basically they torture him by drilling into his mouth. And we get the question, ever hear of Joseph Mengele or Christian Zell? And he hasn't heard of him. And, it, and uh, we get, Jesus, Janeway exploded. I thought you were supposed to be this self-proclaimed hotshot historian. Haven't you heard of any Germans except Hitler? You have heard of Hitler. Martin Berman, Babe tried. Berman's dead, most likely. I mean, okay, who've we got? Rudolf Hess, uh, Joseph Goebbels, 
We've got obviously Berman. Uh, Mengele is the angel of death, the doctor at Auschwitz, which I thought was like fairly well known, you know? Heinrich Himmler. I can't think of any of the others off the top of my head to be fair. And again we get, yeah, so we get N-bombs and then we get this derogatory term for um, Latin Americans as well, which is a shame, but you know, hey ho. I mean, it's, it is part of the story. I don't think it's part of Goldman's own belief system, you know? But yeah, Marathon Man by William Goldman, it was okay. Uh, actually going back through it, I remember it as enjoying it more than I did actually at the time. A bit like having your teeth done, I guess. Um, but yeah, I probably gave it like a three out of five. Um, it was just okay. As I say, I'm gonna watch the movie and hopefully the movie's a little bit better. I just thought it was very slow and you know, not particularly gripping. None of the characters were particularly likable. Uh, the best bits were these like tooth torture scenes. They were pretty good. Maybe that's just me being a bit ghoulish. <laughs> So yeah, there we have it. There's what I made of Marathon Man by William Goldman. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.